And I would, um, have the privilege of introducing Rowena Field, Dr. Rowena Field. She's a physiotherapist from the Nara region who, as Penny has said, has done a, a PhD which she finished in, within the last year on the role of ketogenic diet and chronic pain. Now, as a GP, I'm really excited about Rowena's research because chronic pain is such a major problem um, for so many people. So I want to set the scene. Um, the AIHW, Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, put out a pain report in 2020 and they say that one in five Australians live with persistent pain. It's often worse for women. And um, for these people, chronic pain is life-limiting and disabling. So that's, I guess, the importance of Rowena's research. So we're going to have a conversation. Um, and um, so Rowena, I'd like you to tell us a bit about chronic pain and the difference between acute pain and chronic pain? Um, it's a really good question because I think a lot of people don't understand the difference between acute pain and chronic pain. I think a lot of health professionals don't understand the difference between acute pain and chronic pain. And they are two very different beasts and they require different sorts of treatment. So if we're trying to treat chronic pain as if it's an acute pain problem, often we don't do very well, <laughs> and our results attest to that. Um, and if you think about what pain is, pain is a protective device that is generated by the brain to essentially slap you up the side of the head and make you take notice that there's a problem and that you need to do something about it. And if we talk about musculoskeletal pain, that pain response, it works a little bit like a barricade at the edge of a, a cliff. So it's designed to stop you getting too close to that edge where you're going to fall off and do some sort of damage to the tissues. And so sometimes that will still happen. You know, something might be too forceful or too fast or too repetitive, and we do fall off that cliff and end up getting some sort of soft tissue damage. And that pain barricade should then pull us back away from the edge. So there's a little bit of space for those tissues to heal. And as that healing process happens, then that barricade should go back to the edge again. But what happens with chronic pain, that barricade gets pulled right back away from the edge and it stays way back away from the edge. And so even though the soft tissues have gone through their normal healing process, the barricade's still way away from, from that point. And instead of that being a protective um, device to help us heal, it now becomes a, something that's actually limiting our recovery. Um, another way to think about it, I usually describe this um, this way to patients, so I'm trying to explain it to them, is that pain's a lot like a car alarm. It is designed to go off and tell you when somebody's trying to break in and steal your car. Um, and acute pain works in that same sort of way. It should go off and tell you when something's going wrong <laughs> in the body. Um, but with chronic pain, it's as if that car alarm has now become super sensitive and now everything sets that car alarm off. So plane flies overhead, car alarm goes off. Now, it's not that the car alarm is not real. It's real and it's doing the job that it was designed to do, but now it's overprotecting and it's overdoing the job that it should be doing. And so we get into a situation now where that car alarm going off is not really giving you good evidence or good information anymore about what's actually going on with the car. And the same thing happens with chronic pain. It's not really giving you good evidence anymore about what's actually going on at a tissue level. And so... With chronic pain, it becomes less and less about the structures that were hurt in the first place and more and more about the nervous system that actually looks after that body part. And so I think we often struggle when we're trying to treat people with chronic pain because we don't realise all these changes that have actually gone on and it's now a complex system problem rather than it being a structure problem that we sort of probably thought about in the first place. And we're very good at dealing with acute pain problems. You know, if I go out the front here and get hit by a bus, I want you to take me to the emergency department because we're really good at that sort of medicine. You know, they'll hopefully give me some pain meds. <laughs> give you some morphine. <laughs> give me some morphine. They'll do some scans. They'll probably, you know, if I've broken my leg, they'll stick a cast on it or something like that. And that's all great management for an acute pain problem where there's some new tissue damage that's just happened. 
But if I've still got chronic pain in that leg a year down the track, rocking up to A&E is a total waste of time because they're still going to try and do the same thing. They'll probably give me some medication and they'll probably, you know, scan it and say, oh, how, you know, how about we put a, a brace on it and give it a rest and see if that improves the problem. But it doesn't work very well because now we're dealing with different things that are driving that pain. And we really need to stand back and have a look at the bigger picture and say, what sort of treatments can we do for chronic pain that actually affect the whole person rather than getting really focused on the structure that was the original problem? And that's where diet sort of starts to fit into this story because it's a whole person treatment with what we're doing. Does that answer my question? <laughs> yep, that, that's, that's a great cue for me um, because, and the thing that's uh, struck me there is it's a complex system problem mm. and um, let me tell you about um, general practice and <laughs> some of the associations of um, chronic pain. Uh, many of you will be familiar with um, metabolic syndrome, obesity, overweight, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease. Funnily enough all these things tend to cluster with chronic pain. They all go together. Mm. Um, and doctors are very good at seeing these things as separate problems. We'll give you a problem list. Um, there's your chronic back pain. Here's uh, your hypertension. Here's your diabetes. Here's a pill for here are the pills for your chronic pain, uh, the anti-inflammatory. Uh, here are the pills for your diabetes. Here's the pills for your um, hypertension. And this is how we get polypharmacy. Uh, and doctors refer people to physios, osteopaths. We also refer people with chronic pain to psychologists because we know it's all in their mind. It's all made up. Um, yep. um, they go to the pain specialists. They have um, steroid injections. They go to surgeons. And when all else fails, we send them to the psychologist. What are we missing? <laughs> I think the big thing that we're missing is that other things that are common between those metabolic problems and the things that are common now with chronic pain. And I think most of you would probably agree with me that um, a, an increase in inflammation is what's driving cardiovascular disease and obesity, and it's involved in all of those metabolic um, problems. But we also see an increase in uh, metaflammation or low level inflammation in chronic pain as well. If we look at the research that looks at blood markers for people that have chronic pain um, presentations, they have an increased level of inflammatory soup. And so, you know, all of these things are sort of part of the same problem rather than being siloed into separate problems that like it tends to happen when they go to see the GP. And I'm not sure what your chronic pain patients look like, Liz, but mine that come and see me, they, there's nobody that walks through the door that is the picture of health and the only thing that's wrong with them is a, you know, rip roaring chronic back pain or elbow pain or whatever the thing might be. They are all walking in the door with they're a bit overweight, their blood pressure's up a little bit, the doctor's now saying you know, that their blood sugar's getting up a little bit high, they're depressed, they're anxious. Yes. It's all part of <laughs> the same problem. Mm, absolutely. So there was no mention of diet in the AIHW pain report. <laughs> Why do you reckon? <laughs> Yes, that's a big oversight, isn't it? And I think it's because um, all the, the lifestyle approaches to managing these problems are really, an, they're seen as an afterthought. You know, our, our way of managing these problems is always, you know, or particularly with chronic pain, is, you know, what medication can we give them? What procedure can we give them? You know, what next specialist can we send them off to or what scan can be done? <coughs> And it's only when all those avenues are exhausted, then, you know, the health professional says, oh, okay, well, maybe you, we could look at, you know, maybe you should improve your diet and lose a little bit of weight. It's sort of just tacked on at the end. I don't think they really actually believe that changing diet could really actually change the person's outcome. And so it just sort of gets, you know, put to the side as not a useful or not first line strategy anyway. So this is actually a really radical concept. The idea of a diet um, can make a difference for pain. What were your findings? Now, um, I'll just point out, you've probably all been staring at that um, uh, poster up there. Um, tell us a bit about your study. I, I know what the outcome of the study <laughs> was, but for this audience, what did you find? Um, so don't worry if you can't read the poster because it will be when I remember to bring it from my motel room tomorrow. It will be, <laughs> be in the room to have a look at. Yep. Um, what did what did your yeah what did your patient cohort think about pain and diet? Yep. So the first study that we did was a, a nice little cross-sectional study just to look at a bunch of people that had chronic pain and find out 
what did they think about their diet? What did they think their diet had to do with their pain outcomes or whether it could influence it and what they sort of thought of their health? And funnily enough, <laughs> There was really nothing on the radar at all in terms of thinking about, you know, the, the diet might influence their, their pain outcomes at all. If we asked them, you know, whether they thought they were healthy, um, you know, 50%, over 50% said they rated their, their um, pain, as, uh, their um, health as good, and yet they had at least one comorbidity, an average of three comorbidities, an average BMI of 31, and most of them had put on 10 to 15 kilos since their pain started. So they really weren't the picture of metabolic health despite deluding themselves into thinking that they were. And if we ask them, um, you know, um, whether they thought that their, their diet affected their, um, their pain outcomes, they didn't think of that at all. There were a few people that, that made the connection between, well, maybe gluten or dairy affects me, but I think they were talking more about, you know, gastrointestinal intestinal discomfort rather than their musculoskeletal pain. So there was really um, a, a lack of any sort of perceived relationship between, between the two. Mm. Um, so what, did you, what are the main findings from your study? Yep. So the study that we ended up doing, we did a, a pilot randomised controlled trial. And when we set this trial up, there were a couple of things that we did to try and preempt the criticism <laughs> that we were going to get for this. And so the first thing that I did was we, we did a couple of big um, systematic reviews and, and um, scoping reviews to have a look at what were the plausible mechanisms by which the diet that we wanted to do could actually affect the nervous system. Because if we looked back at all of the research that had been done up to this point, all of the studies, and, and so in the, meta, um, the systematic review that we did, we found about 48 different um, trials that looked at giving a specific diet for chronic pain. And they range from everything from your vegan vegetarians through to Mediterraneans and gluten free and all the rest of it. But all of those diets, the people or the researchers doing those studies, they just picked their favourite diet. <laughs> Essentially, there was, no, there was no real reasoning as to why this diet would actually do something to improve pain other than that the researchers believed that it would. And so, you know, we were really trying to address that sort of bias by saying, well, no, actually, we've gone back and done the work to have a look and see if we change and give somebody like a low carbohydrate diet, what are the mechanisms by which the nervous system might be um, improved in a chronic pain scenario? So that was the first thing that we did. The second thing was to address the criticism where um, by putting somebody on a diet, regardless of what that diet might be, you're generally comparing it then to um, a, a standard Western diet. So was it really the diet that helped or was it just the fact that you cleaned up their diet a little bit and pulled the rubbish out and it was that that actually helped their pain outcomes? So what we did was a three week run in for everybody on the trial and in that run in period, everybody had to remove all the ultra processed foods from their diet. So there's no talk of carbohydrates or anything like that. It was just, let's pull all the rubbish out. We used the Nova classification system to do that. So a category four, um, which just is basically all your fun stuff, all the, <laughs> all the ultra processed, hyper palatable foods. We asked them to remove those. Then at the three week mark, we then randomized them either to keep doing that diet or to um, actually go on a low carb ketogenic diet where we reduce the carbohydrates down to 50 grams per day or, or less. Um, and then they <coughs> continued that for, for another nine weeks. And so when we looked at the pain outcomes at the end of all of that, I think um, the results are actually important in that both groups got a significant improvement in their pain outcomes. Now, the, the low-carb ketogenic group, um, when you're looking at numbers, probably got a slightly larger increase, but it's important to note that both groups did Im improve. But if we look specifically at the ketogenic group, um, when, we, when we're trying to figure out what's a meaningful change in a pain outcome, so normally we measure people's um, pain out of uh, you know, a 0 to 10 scale. And so the literature would say that a change from somewhere between 1 out of 10 to 3 out of 10 is a clinically significant change. And so if we went at that higher benchmark and said, okay, how many people in the ketogenic group improved at least 3 out of 10 on their pain scale, we got a third of the group that, that did improve. And if we brought 
sort of down to the lower benchmark of just a one out of 10 improvement, then two thirds of the ketogenic group um, improved at least that much on their, on their pain outcomes. But the other difference for the ketogenic group was that they also had a significant reduction in their inflammatory biomarkers. They had a significant weight loss and they also had significant improvements on their anxiety and depression scores as well, which the other group didn't get. So there is definitely added benefits. And when we're again looking at this whole system approach to treating somebody, improving their weight and improving their depression scores and all those sort of things are all just extra bang for your buck when we're trying to help somebody with chronic pain. Let's talk about some of those mechanisms. Um, and you mentioned inflammation and you also talked earlier about the nervous system. Let's try and put all those things together. Okay. <laughs> um, so if we're thinking about what we do when we put somebody onto a low carb or a ketogenic diet, we're sort of doing two things. On one side, we're reducing their carbohydrate intake. So we're going to have all the changes that occur with like a, a lowering of the blood glucose level, um, a reduction in the excursions of blood glucose and the, um, a, a lesser amount of insulin required to manage it. So there's that side to the story. Um, but then also the other side is that we're now changing to fat oxidation as the, as the fuel source and ketones are being produced. Now, both of those things will do significant um, or make significant changes to physiology in a way that is going to be beneficial for pain outcomes. So if we take the reduction in, in glucose side first, when we reduce the glucose load in, some, in, in a person, what it does is it reduces the amount of glycation that's happening um, in proteins. So we're all fairly familiar with the idea of, of the glucose molecule sticking itself to, you know, like haemoglobin and affecting how that protein functions. So it doesn't do as good a job of carrying oxygen around the body. But glucose doesn't only stick itself to the proteins in the blood. It also sticks itself to the proteins in your ligaments, in your tendons, in your cartilage and in your neurons as well. And is going to adversely affect how those proteins function as well. And if we take our poor diabetics as the example for, for this, it's really common to see in diabetes people that have painful neuropathies and painful tendinopathies. They are both far more common in a diabetic population. And that's the reason why, is that extra glucose that's floating around in that system affects how the proteins function in those various soft tissues. And those proteins that are affected, they're, they're called ages, so advanced glycation end products. And we have receptors for those um, molecules on our nerves and in the various soft tissues. And when they are uh, activated, they trigger an immune system response, which is inflammatory. So, you know, having that, those, um, those glycated molecules is potentially a problem if you've got pain as the thing that you're trying to, to deal with. We also know that those um, ages also trigger enzymes within the cartilage to cause it to degrade in the matrix. So for a long time, we've always assumed that something like um, chronic knee arthritis, it's the wear and tear that's causing that pain. You know, the joint's worn out, the cartilage is worn out. And that's part of the story. But the other part of the story is that if you've got a high glucose load going on in that person, then they've also had metabolic changes in that cartilage that are also part of that pain producing process. And when we look at the research that um, changes diet for somebody with a chronic knee problem like that, we often see improvements, even though there hasn't been a big weight reduction. So it's not just about the biomechanical load, it's also about how that sugar or the, the glucose affects all of those, those soft tissues. Basically, so, glucose buggers up biochemistry. Yes. <laughs> That's the summary of all that stuff that I just said. <laughs> so on the other side of the story, <laughs> the other side to the story is that we are now um, changing to fat, fat oxidation and we are producing ketones. Now, we know that ketones are a great energy source, but the other thing about ketones is that they are a powerful signaling molecule and they travel around in the blood a little bit like hormones do and they have certain um, actions that they trigger in various tissues and within various pathways. And probably the main ones that are related to pain management are the first one is that ketones seem to have 
fancy term is a neuromodulatory response, which just basically means it helps with a, a nervous system that's sensitised. So if we look at how excitable a nervous system should be, there's a, a Goldilocks level <laughs> or a homeostatic level of how excitable those nerves should function. And that includes both in an individual neuron, between two neurons and how they talk to each other and within whole networks of neurons as well. And if that excitability starts to get a little bit too high, we end up with a problem where that nerve is triggering too easily. Or if it starts to get too low, then it can't trigger when it's supposed to. And what we see with chronic pain is that we have a central and peripheral nervous system that is now sensitised. So it's sitting up high on that scale of where it should be and it's triggering too easily. That's our car alarm that we talked about earlier that's now going off too, too easily. And what ketones seem to do is they seem to help to bring that back into a, a regulated zone. Um, and so there's lots of different proposed mechanisms about how that might be, but it's got to do potentially with the GABA to glutamate ratio or the ratio of um, you know, excitatory to inhibitory um, neurotransmitters. Um, but there's lots of other different mechanisms in there as well that you can read on the poster if you want to. <laughs> um, and the other thing that ketones do are they, are, they promote anti-inflammatory um, pathways. So they actually block the NLRP3 inflammasome. And so they're quite a powerful anti-inflammatory mechanism. And there's quite a lot of other ones as well, but we won't go into all of those because Rod's poking his finger up at me at the back of the room. I'm, I'm going to make a comment here. Um, I mentioned uh, doctors, when, when doctors fail to fix the problem, our natural tendency is to blame the patient. And that's the pain is in your mind um, thing. And a lot of people have probably been told um, it, it's all in your, you, in your mind, live with it. What you're saying actually is pain is in the brain. Pain it's, is produced by the brain, yes. Yeah, it's produced by the brain. It's part of that neural network. And what uh, ketones are doing on a number of different levels is they're changing the biochemistry in the brain um, and helping to dampen down that hyperexcitability. Mm. So um, my typical patient demographic is female um, 50s to 60s, so getting older, ageing baby boomer, um, obese, sedentary, stressed to the max, elderly parents, teenage children, um, working, um, trying to fit everything in. Got a crook knee, a back that plays up from time to time, fatty liver, pre-diabetes, anxious. I'm glad I don't have your job. <laughs> and multiple medications. And then they come, you see their name and you kind of go, oh no. Where do I start? <laughs> Yes, well, that's a that is a tricky one, <laughs> and it's it's hard for the GP because they haven't got a lot of time to mm. you know try and sell a, a diet to somebody with chronic pain. But I think you know I guess the take homes from all the research that we've done would be to say maybe rather than approach it as I want to put you on a diet because we tend lose to lose weight. You we associate diets weight. with losing weight, so maybe we could come at it more from the angle of. We know that with your chronic pain problem, you've got an increased level of inflammation. What can we play around with in your diet that might actually target that inflammation? So now it becomes a treatment strategy for chronic pain rather than I'm putting you on a diet. And the other important thing would be to say that even if the only buy-in you can get at the start is let's just pull the ultra-processed foods out, we know that that's going to be a good starting point because if you can get a little bit of attraction in that area and they start to feel a little bit better, then you might be able to have a, a bigger conversation about you know low carb down the track and when we looked at the trial um, with the experience that people had one of the biggest facilitators in being able to do the diet successfully was to have somebody that was coaching them and so that would be the other thing that I would say would be to sort of try and link in with a, a low carb dietitian or health coach or something like that so you've got somebody that's actually helping them implement it. Yep okay um so I think you've just answered that question. What did what Rod's did you the, yeah What did you <laughs> find um, help people get there and stick with this unsustainable diet? It's really yeah having, having that assistance. I think yeah. with, with um, 
somebody there to help them along and having good resources. So things like Diet Doctor and those sort of websites are great for yep. that sort of thing too. Okay. We'll wrap it up here. <laughs> thank you very much for listening. And thanks.